Hi everybody, hope you're well. Today I'll read from a very compelling book titled Engineering the Eternal City, Infrastructure, Topography and the Culture of Knowledge in Late 16th Century Rome by Pamela Long, published by University of Chicago Press. Rome, circa 1560, was a city of resplendent processions, ancient ruins and crumbling infrastructure. It was also a city in the process of being reimagined visually by means of images, including cartographical images, and physically by means of construction and large-scale engineering projects. Between 1560 and 1590, the city bustled with activity. The building and renovation of churches, palaces and walls, the repair and reconstruction of two great aqueducts, the creation of new fountains made possible by the greatly augmented water supply, the widening and paving of streets, the redesign of streets and piazze, the transport of obelisks from their ancient Roman resting places to new locations, and projects aimed at preventing the periodic catastrophic flooding of the Tiber River. Rome was a city headed by popes, but also governed by the traditional city government known as the Capitoline government. As a city undergoing multiple transformations, it served as a magnet for learned humanist and outwardly striving clerics, and for painters, sculptors, architect engineers and other workers seeking employment in projects of urban engineering and building construction. It was also home to numerous elites, cardinals, ambassadors, and Roman noble families. Despite lip service to papal absolutism, the city was characterized by multiple centers of power and patronage. The Pope stood at the head of the papal states, the city of Rome, and the Catholic Church. Papal governance was influenced by the Council of Trent, a church council assembled to reform a Catholic Church under attack by the Protestants. Pius IV ended the council in 1563 and promulgated its decrees in 1564. Included among them was the encouragement of the material enhancement of divine worship, including the use of paintings and other visual images in churches. Such reforms were accompanied in Rome by the vision that a reformed church should be represented by a renewed capital city. This city would be as magnificent as Imperial Rome had been. The ideals of Renovatio Imperi and Renovatio Rome lay behind the reconstruction and renewal of Rome. The popes should rule, as the Roman emperors had, a splendid and now also Christian city. In this book, Pamela Long investigates major projects of engineering and urban redesign. She treats uh, both the physical city and visual representations of the city. The chronological range, uh, with exceptions mostly having to do with cartography, focuses on the period between the Great Flood of 1557 and the death of the great urbanizing Pope Sixtus V in 1590. In some ways, Roman urban development in the late 16th century reflected that of other cities in Italy and elsewhere on the continent. This included rising populations and multiple projects of construction and renovation influenced by the rediscovery of the ancient world and its urban vocabulary. Rome's cityscape encompassed a growing concept of elite family honor associated with great palaces often sited on dramatic urban spaces. These developments tied power, authority and family prestige to conspicuous consumption, grand physical structures, open piazze framed by palatial facades and straight wide streets that were paved. While Rome was being transformed physically, cartographical and other kinds of visual images of the city flooded the urban marketplace. Map making and printing came to be closely tied to the study of antiquities, surveying, engineering, construction and urban redesign. Often accompanying these activities were intense discussions about how to proceed, ardent competition for contracts and acrimonious arguments concerning such topics as the location of the ancient Roman Forum. 
Humanists, antiquarians, painters, designers, engineers, architects, engravers, woodblock cutters and printers created maps, views and plans of the ancient city and its contemporary counterpart as well as images of streets, squares, statues, columns and buildings. These images were presented to potential patrons and sold to residents of the city or to eager visitors including pilgrims and antiquarians. Engineering and urban reconstruction, the study of Roman antiquities and Roman topography, and the creation of city plans and maps function as deeply interrelated activities and practices. The way in which engineering projects were undertaken encouraged interaction on many levels between practically trained men on the one hand and learned university-educated men on the other. It was a time of intense engineering and construction activity that occurred well before the modern professionalization of engineering, architecture and archaeology. These activities were not clearly separated one from another. Engineers and architects came from diverse backgrounds and typically engaged in a far wider range of activities than do engineers and architects today. Historians of architecture in particular have posited 15th and 16th century Italy, including Rome, as the locus for the origin of the modern profession of architecture. They point to the separation of building design from building construction, the acquisition of a particular skill set, including the skills of drawing, model making, surveying and other mathematical proficiencies, and rising social status. The same period incubated the concept of the engineer, associated particularly with military matters, especially triangular bastion fortification. But the ability to win contracts depended as much on patronage as on any specific training. Men called architetti were also given other descriptive titles and engaged in activities far more diverse than the usual activities of modern architects. Competition among individuals and groups for major urban contracts was the norm. Romans often debated, uh, decided on and carried out engineering and construction projects in contentious and competitive ways. Similarly, enthusiasts from a variety of backgrounds studied Roman topography, ruins and antiquities with intensity, often cooperatively, but at times within the context of a bitter argument. Such modes of investigation and construction contributed to a culture of knowledge in which engineering practice gained legitimacy as a topic of interest in both practical and learned cultures. Substantive communication occurred between university-educated people and those trained in artisanal workshops or in other practical technical venues. People from different backgrounds offered opinions, suggested alternatives, conversed and argued with one another, and produced advisory writings, drawings and maps. To understand late 16th century Rome, it is necessary to grasp at least in broad outline the structures and workings of urban power and the complexities of patronage and governance. The most powerful person in Rome was the Pope. The Pope's governance of the city was carried out primarily by the part of the papal bureaucracy, known as the Camera Apostolica. Yet, the power of the Popes, no matter how much they may have wished it, was not absolute. Moreover, the Popes were individuals with very different backgrounds and abilities, whose interest in the city of Rome as a physical site varied widely. More than any other European city, Rome possessed multiple centers of power and patronage. It was a unique characteristic of the city that the central figure of the patronage network, the Pope, usually belonged to a family entirely different from the families of both his immediate predecessor and his successor. At each new papal succession, radical changes in patronage could occur including new courtiers, new officers, new favorites, new cardinals and new patronage networks as an entirely new family reaped the huge benefits that accrued to the papal crown. It was not uncommon for a new pope to be the actual enemy of his immediate predecessor. At the same time, a complex group of rituals accompanied the death of one pope and the crowning of his successor, providing a stable structure of transition from one papacy to the next. This book focuses on a period dominated by four popes. 
each was strikingly different from, if not hostile to, his predecessor, and each shaped the city in his own particular way. Each played an important role in the renewal of urban infrastructure, the redesign of streets, hydraulic engineering projects, and urban construction and reconstruction. Knowledge of their backgrounds, personalities, and ideals is necessary to a contextual urban history of Rome. Pamela Long is an independent historian of late medieval and early modern Europe and of the history of science and technology. As for her book, uh, At Your Local Bookstore, thank you very much for watching this video and see you in the next one. Bye.